Joining us now from the Michigan Poison Center is Dr. Varun Vora. He's the academic director as well as a clinical toxicologist over at the Michigan Poison Center. Dr. Vora, thank you for being with us again. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate having you on. So we've uh, received some concerning information re of recently uh, from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, uh, that's issued a consumer warning regarding unproven health benefit claims related to uh, many vaping products. And of course, uh, your organization, the Michigan Poison and Drug Information Center at Wayne State University, notes that vaping products marketed with claims that may, among these are uh, products marketed with claims that they help treat cancer, improve mental health, or help with treatment for chronic respiratory conditions, and that these claims are fraudulent. Where are we seeing these in particular uh, with these products, and, and especially considering how highly regulated tobacco products and, and vaping products are uh, at mm -hmm. this moment in time in, in Michigan and, and across the country, how are these sort of claims that are so unfounded pushing through to these marketed products? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of these vaping products, like you mentioned, are highly regulated, but these companies are pretty innovative and adaptable to, to the regulations. So something that we are seeing uh, more and more of is what we call tobacco-free uh, vape products or tobacco-free nicotine. So it's kind of like a synthetic nicotine, yeah. um, which, these, which these companies are sort of circumventing regulations um, by marketing them or trying to market them to youth and with attractive flavors and bright colors, et cetera. So we're seeing uh, these products make their way to high schoolers, middle schoolers, and whatnot. Um, although even in the past few years, the number has declined in terms of the use amongst high schoolers and middle schoolers, but the numbers are still pretty staggering over between like two and three million, um, at least reported according to some surveys and monitoring the future survey, especially as a prominent one. Um, so these companies are taking a playbook, especially from uh, previous sort of campaigns from, you know, big tobacco and whatnot from uh, cigarette campaigns back in the day uh, where they're where they're sort of circumventing the regulations by be, by using sort of newer products, uh, newer packaging, uh, different types of formulations and whatnot. So um, you're right. The you know, the, our center does not support those claims at all for the proven or unproven health benefits. Um, there is no evidence to suggest um, that these products do are associated with those uh, purported benefits. Um, if anything, <clears throat> they've been shown to have opposite effects in terms of um, potentially causing, uh, being linked to anxiety, depression, um, dependence as well, as well as being highly toxic with these newer products. They're highly concentrated uh, nicotine products, um, even highly concentrated marijuana products if they get into the wrong hands, like a child's. Uh, can be it doesn't take a lot to be really really toxic um, and it can cause some serious side effects especially seizures and uh, respiratory arrest as well and really bad overdoses um, so we're cautioning people to to keep these products away from children don't use them around children uh, keep them up and away from them as well um, because they carry a lot of risks and in particular for uh, children and teens and for young adults that are using these vaping products uh, obviously there are uh, hazards that go along with these products similar to tobacco or to any other drugs or to alcohol uh, for adults that are of, a, of legal age to consume these products but particularly for uh, younger people for teens and for young adults that are consuming these products are there more adverse effects of using vaping products uh, uh, regularly because their bodies are still developing and if so what what are those yeah, I mean, there are, there are reports and evidence to, to suggest that these, this demographic is more uh, vulnerable because of their ongoing brain development um, and their ongoing uh, neurocognitive development in general, um, as well as uh, there's been, there have been reports of increasing uh, respiratory issues, especially with vaping uh, marijuana products with wheezing and sort of whistling in the chest as well um, in, in youth. Um, so... There are potential adverse effects. Um, they they've been highly documented. Uh, we don't, you know, we recommend their use in in adults um, who who are of age, um, who are using it responsibly as well. Um, and we're trying, you know, there's been the sort of the federal push as well as the state push to to um, prohibit marketing towards minors as well. And that's going to be that's going to continue to be a big issue um, and initiative going forward and helping to mitigate uh, the effects on uh, the young population. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora, uh, the 
uh, academic director and a clinical toxicologist at the Michigan Poison Center uh, over at Wayne State University joining us on the MegaCast. And Dr. Vora, uh, in addition to the growing concerns with vaping products, there's a the continuing concern uh, with opioid use and opioid misuse. And typically when we are thinking about uh, who is misusing these drugs or who ends up uh, abusing these drugs or becoming addicted to, opi to opiates later on uh, in their usage. We tend to think of younger people, but there's been a recent uptick or uh, recent nu numbers and, and statistics have shown that those age 55 and older are becoming more susceptible to this misuse or more regularly misusing these drugs. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight on how prevalent of a problem this has become um, amongst older Americans and, and what may be some of the rationale behind why the medical mm -hmm. community may believe that that is becoming so much more prevalent? You know, I think, you know, and this, this might be conjecture, it's not um, validated by okay. any Evidence, but there is evidence to suggest that um, use and abuse and even overdoses are going up and as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic as well and the sort of the psychosocial effects that the pandemic has had on people, whether it's been socially um, via employment or loss of employment, um, increasing rates of depression, anxiety. Um, it's it's kind of a tenuous, tenuous time right now. So we are seeing um, more, more overdoses, more ingestions, especially um, and sort of the extremes of age as well, sort of in younger children and older adults. Um, so that is very that is very salient. Um, we do have resources at our center to help people with um, opioid or substance use disorder. So please contact us at 1-800-222-1222. We can link you to a variety of different resources and we have um, toxicologists on staff who actually are specialists in addiction medicine as well who can help. Um, who, who do a great job. So, and not only that, we can link you to resources with uh, the state health as well at MDHHS, uh, who, who also does a fantastic job at linking people to, to care that they need. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora from the Michigan Poison Center joining us on the Megacast. And uh, being now that we're into the thick of things uh, in the winter months, another common hazard that, that creeps up and is preventable uh, is carbon monoxide poisoning in the home. Can, can you talk a little bit about what can go wrong in our, in our heating systems and other systems <clears> in the <throat> home or other risk factors that may put uh, carbon monoxide exposure at home or in other places at an increase during this time of the year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of calls uh, as, as is expected during the winter months uh, regarding carbon monoxide exposures. So where it comes from essentially is essentially the incomplete combustion or when things don't fully burn um, of carbon-based fuels. So things like charcoal, propane, you know, natural gas, things of that nature. Um, and the issue is that it is colorless and it's odorless. So it's not really detectable. That's why we have, we advocate for people having functional carbon monoxide uh, detectors on every floor of their home. Uh, signs and symptoms to look out for, you can start getting headaches, uh, you can get nausea, some diarrhea, you start getting tired, and some people with enough exposures, they actually pass out um, and lose consciousness. So that's a really serious event. And this can be you know, vulnerable in, in uh, populations like children, pregnant patients as well, elderly individuals. Um, so in the event that you are um, potentially exposed or think you might be exposed, uh, you wanna make sure that you evacuate the premises immediately, make sure that you ventilate the home as well, open doors, open windows. I know that sounds counterintuitive, especially in the winter months, but that'll help ventilate the, um, the space uh, and, and prevent the, the concentration of the gas in that enclosed space. Um, we also want to make sure that you're having your furnace and water heater inspected yearly because a lot of times, you know, when, when the power goes out and whatnot, people are running um, uh, generators and that can be a major issue and exposure, potential exposure risk um, to people, especially when they're using it in enclosed spaces um, or near the home. So we always advocate for people to use it uh, well away from the home, at least 20 feet away. Um, don't use them in enclosed spaces. Same with kerosene space heaters as well. Try not to use them in enclosed spaces. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially this season with uh, football season and whatnot, grilling is a big, big thing. And people like to do it in their garage. Obviously they don't want to stand out in the cold and, and be grilling. So if you're going to be doing that, make sure that the door, the garage doors are open. There's a ventilated space for the gas to escape. Um, and it's the same principle applies to running a car. You don't want to run a car 
um, in a closed garage. You want to make sure that the space is ventilated, that the garage is open, the doors are open um, to allow the gas to escape to, uh, to mitigate any uh, harmful effects. And, and typically in a home environment, when it comes to carbon monoxide uh, poisoning, these, these symptoms that you discussed, are they typically more sudden onset at a certain exposure or, or could these be more gradual and maybe go undetected by, for example, carbon monoxide alarms, as you said, that are not up to date or don't have proper batteries or, or out, outdated yeah. altogether or that simply are not detecting lower levels of carbon monoxide exposure? Yeah, it all depends on the nature of the exposure and the extent, right? So that's why we advocate for people to have to inspect um, their their detectors regularly, make sure that they're functioning, um, that they have um, adequate battery support, and that they're on every floor. Uh, depends on the concentration too. Um, I mean, you know, more highly concentrated exposures are going to have more severe effects, likely more uh, <clears throat> sudden per se in terms of the severity of it. Um, Whereas lower level exposures, you'll start to see sort of a gradual onset of that headache, sort of that feeling sort of dizzy, nauseous. You'll have maybe potentially some chest pain as well. With severe exposures, it can affect the heart. Um, so it's it's a very serious um, exposure and one that uh, we're always on the lookout for, especially because it's odorless and colorless. So it, it uh, it's not readily detectable. It doesn't have any what we call warning properties like a smell or something to, to tip people off. And as people during the season, Dr. Vora, are, are typically staying in more often, uh, that often uh, includes them then cleaning their homes more often because they have more activity in the home, more reasons for yep. the, the home to be getting dirty. And, and in doing so, they're using a lot more cleaning products, which can also have their own uh, hazards as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of those mm -hmm. common hazards that we see pop up in, in people that are using these cleaning products in their home? Uh, either immediately or over time as they're exposed to some of these different uh, cleaning agents that do a good job, but if you don't use them properly, can be very dangerous. Yeah, so oftentimes we'll get calls from, from individuals who um, will be mixing cleaning products. So that's a common sort of exposure that we get. And there's uh, typical scenarios that we have so if they're in their in their bathroom and they're cleaning um, using bleach, uh, bleach with something like ammonia, um, so that's going to create a compound called chloramine. So bleach is sodium hypochlorite, and uh, mixing it with ammonia, you're going to have this product called chloramine, like I mentioned, which has pretty high water solubility, meaning that's going to affect more of the upper airways. Um, so you're going to have you know sinus irritation, you're going to have headache, cough, wheezing, things of that nature. So. Um, the best advice would be to not mix those products and to use them individually and as instructed and as labeled. Um, and in the event that there is an exposure and you happen to mix them, exit the exit the restroom or the area where you are, ventilate the area as well, open the windows, um, and, and get out of that space for the time being. Um, other mixing products, uh, which can potentially be um, a little more severe, is when people mix bleach with acid. So that's bleach with something like toilet bowl cleaner. So toilet bowl cleaner often has something like muriatic acid or hydrochloric acid. So the bleach plus the hydrochloric acid can create a plume of chlorine gas, which can get deeper sort of in the airways um, and, and travel further and cause um, some pretty severe effects. So if it's not if it's not treated adequately. So again, same, same principle applies. You wanna evacuate the space, ventilate the area, do not mix these products. I mean, the event that the symptoms still persist for any reason from either of those combinations, uh, call us um, immediately at 1-800-222-1222, um, and we can we can direct you accordingly as to what to do on your next steps. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora from the Michigan Poison Center. He is their academic director as well as a clinical toxicologist over at the Michigan Poison Center at Wayne State University. Uh, Dr. Vora, lastly, the Detroit News recently had a report talking about the uh, prevalence of uh, lead concerns all across the state of Michigan, particularly in water as well as uh, lead exposure in older homes, mostly those bu built uh, before 1978 when, of course, lead paint and other products in the home were, were banned. How prevalent is the presence of lead in a lot of these older homes? And, and what would you suggest, what would the Poison Center suggest for people to go about if they're living in an older home, uh, testing or examining their home to, to ensure that either they don't have any of these lead products remaining in their home, or if they do, that they're able to pinpoint them and determine the safety or lack thereof of these products still being in their homes. 
Yeah, so like you mentioned, you know, homes built pre-1978 when they were using sort of lead-based paint. Um, those are the homes that we we often worry about where the the paint chips could be um, could be coming off and flaking. Um, and, you know, populations where we're really concerned are especially children, right? Because unlike adults, children actually absorb a higher percentage of, of lead um, and uh, in their growing bodies, and they have pretty severe potential effects on metabolism, their brain development, cognition, or behavioral issues going forward. Um, so that's why we're really, really sensitive to to mitigating those those effects and their exposure risks. Um, and you know, lead can can leach from from old piping as well, and plumbing, um, solder as well, and homes with older infrastructure. So. In that event, yeah, we recommend, um, you know, there are environmental agencies, even the APA, that can do environmental inspections of the home um, to make sure that the lead levels are um, below um, the, the acceptable limits um, or within acceptable limits. And, um, you know, we have childhood uh, lead prevention programs as well, where uh, Poison Center is a, is a good referral spot especially in the Metro Detroit area um, to call us and we can we can set those kids up um, with the necessary care and screening that they need. And in the event that they're, they have elevated lead levels, we connect them with the proper treatment, uh, with, the, with the antidote treatment that they need, uh, depending on the level of exposure. Um, so please use us as a, as a resource. We are um, an excellent resource to help connect people to that care that they need. Um, so again, 1-800-222-1222. Um, and follow us on uh, social media as well as our website as well to get more information on the, the health effects of, of lead exposure. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora. He is the academic director and the clinical toxicologist at the Michigan Poison Center. You can learn more information by visiting their website at poison.med.wayne.edu uh, or by calling 1-800-222-1222, especially if you uh, uh, believe that you have an exposure in your home. Again, that phone number, 1-800-222-1222. Dr. Vora, uh, just another couple minutes with you. Anything else at this time that would be important for our audience to be keeping in mind uh, in their home or, or in other areas of life that may be uh, common hazards at this moment in time or in this part of the season or any other information that's important uh, from the Michigan Poison Center for our audience to be aware of at this time? Yeah, I think there are a couple things, you know, um, the ongoing sort of exposures to, to hand sanitizers, especially to, to young kids. I know, you know, with, with the COVID pandemic, people are more focused and um, aware of hand hygiene. So keeping those products away and out of the reach of children um, and using them responsibly um, because there have been and there has been an uptake in national increases in pediatric exposures to, to these hand sanitizers. Um, there have also been products out there uh, with hand sanitizers containing toxic alcohols like methanol, which are not supposed to be um, in hand sanitizers above a certain limit per se. Um, and those can be really, really dangerous and deadly. So uh, the FDA does have a list. If you look at uh, FDA do not use hand sanitizer list, it produces a list of um, brands of hand sanitizers that you should not use because they've been associated with the presence of things like methanol. Um, and in the same segue, toxic alcohols, methanol and ethylene glycol, they're frequently found in windshield washer fluids like methanol and ethylene glycols and uh, antifreeze radiator antifreeze. These things are found in the garage. Uh, these things can be highly, highly toxic. Uh, methanol can lead to, to seizures, to uh, blindness as well. They both can potentially lead to death and organ damage. Ethylene glycol can lead to kidney damage. Um, ethylene glycol is very sweet tasting, so it can potentially attract, and they're colorful products as well, so they can attra attract um, uh, demographics like children. Um, so please keep these products away out of the reach of children in a locked cabinet in the garage. They're highly toxic, highly dangerous. Um, and we, we get a lot of these calls, especially this time of year when people are using these kinds of products. Well, Dr. Vora, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time and your insight on a number of different issues uh, that are of concern to the Michigan Poison Center. Thanks, Tyler.